Calculation is one of the most important skills to master in chess if you want to become a stronger player. It involves coming up with a plan, visualizing your opponent's best responses to that plan, and then deciding if it still works or if you need to fix it. In this video, we're going to talk about the thought process that will help you calculate more quickly and accurately, even in more complex positions. So at a very basic level, calculation is simply a matter of counting. If you want to move a piece to a square where it is being attacked by an opponent's piece, you need to be able to calculate far enough to make sure that you're not going to be losing material in that exchange of pieces if it does happen. So this is kind of what I'm talking about. If we look at this at face value, this looks like a fine move. Uh, it attacks the rook, it looks like it's protected by a pawn, it's a nice outpost square for this knight. But white may have calculated that, okay, after takes, I can take back with the pawn and it's an equal trade. But if you calculate just one move further, you'll see that this knight is also attacking the square where the knight previously was and black ends up winning a pawn here. So before making a move like this, this is where calculation comes into play. You need to visualize and you need to count. Okay, this square is being defended by one piece. It's being attacked by two pieces. So that means that if white moves here, they're going to be losing material. So let's flip the board and see if we can come up with a better plan for white. So this knight is threatening some things over here, but it doesn't have any other pieces helping it to make those kinds of threats. One thing that I'm immediately seeing is that since this rook moved in, if we can get our knight here, this would be a fork on the two rooks, and at the moment this square is only protected by the queen. So if we can just add one more attacker to this square, this is now threatening this fork and black's gonna have to do something about this. And the best move in this position is actually for the black rook to move back to f8 so that when this knight does eventually come here, we can move this rook in and it's no longer a fork. So that's the kind of thought process that good chess players are constantly running through during the course of a game. Coming up with a plan, refuting it if it doesn't work, and then maybe coming up with a different plan and then putting our pieces in the right places in order to make that plan a reality. So let's take a look at this next position. We're going to come up with a couple candidate moves, which are several different plans, potential plans, see whether they work and refute the ones that don't work. So my immediate thoughts when looking at this position is, okay, black has a really strong pawn chain over here and it would be really nice if we could chip away at this pawn chain with a move like e4 or maybe even b3. So let's look at these two as our two candidate moves. So we'll start by visualizing and then I'll play the moves out on the board. So if we go with b3, right? Let's first imagine the most forcing move, which is a capture. We can capture back with the bishop or the knight. Um, it doesn't really matter. Let's say we capture back with the knight. And then the idea might be to jump our knight here into this outpost square. Now this would be a really strong square for our knight. The problem is that black also has a knight that can easily jump back here and either trade off or prevent us from getting there in the first place, and so this square might not be as strong as it seems. Let's also visualize pawn structure. So remember, we push this, imagine they take, we take. So we have now a backwards pawn on c3. We also have an isolated pawn here on a3, and Black has a two on one here. And in addition, this C pawn, because it's backwards and because after black takes, they won't have a pawn. So this will be a semi-open file for black. This will be really difficult for us to defend as well. So let's play this out and see how it actually looks. So let's run through this line. We take here. Um, let's imagine black just moves a rook in to bring a rook to this semi-open file and attack the pawn. We can jump our knight up here. And now let's say black moves the bishop down. Now this is fine, it's still an objectively equal position, we haven't lost any material. The problem that I'm seeing on a more practical level though, that might prevent me from actually playing this in a game, is that these two pawns, like I said, are super weak and we're going to have to utilize our resources, our pieces down here to defend these two pawns instead of using them for other more exciting things like going on an attack over on the king side. So going all the way back here, that's the kind of calculation that might prevent you from playing a plan because you see that after pushing this pawn, you're actually causing some weaknesses in your own position and being able to visualize a few moves ahead, even if it's not losing you any material, sometimes positional weaknesses can be enough for you to calculate that this is not a plan that you want to do. So let's take a look at our other candidate move, which is pushing in the center here, e4. So already this move feels a lot more natural to me. We are threatening this fork. Um, we're playing in the center while black is trying to attack on the wings. That's often kind of an idea to keep in mind. And if we calculate all the way down through the end of the trades, if black takes, we can take. If black takes, we can take. 
if black takes, we can finally take with the rook. If we challenge ourselves to calculate one move further, what happens when this rook is here? Does black have any threats? Well, they can move the queen down to attack the rook, um, but we can pretty calmly just move our queen in and then maybe even triple up on this file, make a nice cannon aiming up into the black position, and I think we should be totally fine. Now let's play this all out and we'll see if there are any positional deficiencies like there were in our other candidate move that we need to worry about. And again, after a move like this or this, this is just a completely equal position. We've sort of diffused some of the lockdown tension in the center and we've started to get our pieces more into play. I feel like this move on a more practical level is just a lot more natural. And so that's probably the move that I would calculate about that far in order to decide to play it. Now, a lot of times, especially in the middle game, it won't be as simple as having to calculate through an entire capture chain. There will be a lot more options that you'll have to be considering when you're calculating certain moves. So in this position, it's black to play and we need to decide what we're going to do about this pawn if we should take it with the bishop or with the knight. Our king is also a little exposed and so this brings up another concept we need to be thinking about when we're calculating and that is looking for not only what we want to do but also our opponent's threats, what our opponent wants to do. So because our king is so exposed, I can imagine white having a plan like bringing the bishop down, bringing the queen down with check if our king is still here, and then giving a mate here on g7. So this plan is something that I'm constantly going to have to be calculating, even in the midst of all my other calculations like which piece I should take with here, in order to make the best move possible that's a little bit more prophylactic to prevent any deadly threats. So if we take with the knight and the bishop comes in, my first thought was, oh, we can bring the bishop back and just get rid of it that way and prevent any kind of mating ideas here. The problem is this just drops a knight. So we can't do that. But that doesn't mean we should just completely discard our first move. The error in the calculation might have come later in the line. So, okay, if we take with the knight, right, and the bishop comes in, is there any way to protect this square and maybe even prevent the queen from coming in in the first place? Now this might take some stronger strategic vision and I'm not even sure if I would have come up with this move if I was playing this in a blitz game, but this move queen e5 both prevents the queen from coming in or if the queen does come in, we can just take it, right? And get rid of the entire threat. And it's also threatening a move like bishop d3 because we have now protected our knights from the rook ever being able to take it. And a third thing is that it is threatening this bishop. So this move is doing three different things and this queen cannot be easily moved from this square or this general area that will prevent the queen from coming in and giving this check. A lot of times when you're solving puzzles, you're told to look for checks, captures, and threats. And that is really important when you're trying to come up with a plan. It's also equally important to look for your opponent's forcing moves, your opponent's checks, captures, and threats, right? So this is both a check and a threat of checkmate. And so if we can be prophylactic and prevent that from happening, um, we will just have a much stronger position. Now let's go all the way back and see what happens in this position if we instead don't take with the knight, but we take with the bishop, right? So if this bishop comes in, now this bishop on a more practical level, in my opinion, is probably the better piece to take with because it's immediately preventing this move. And in fact, white might not even play this bishop move in the first place because it's going to be a lot easier for us to prevent the queen from coming in. And so we might not even have to find this queen e5 move because the bishop is already doing that job. So the important thing to remember about calculation is that it's very situational. You know, if you're playing in a blitz game, this move should be automatic because it's preventing the queen from coming in, right? If I was playing this position in a classical game, I would be calculating even more lines. Like what if the rook were to take instead of the bishop coming in, if we got this like sacrificing line here and here and then comes in and then like, does this do anything? I don't know, but I have to calculate those kinds of things, see if my opponent has anything and then make my decision from there. But again, it's all contextual. It depends on the game that you're playing, the situation that you're in. Chess is very psychological. And so if you can find a line that practically just makes more sense, that's probably the line that you should go for instead of one that's very complex and you're not quite sure if it works, but if it does, that'd be really neat. Also, if you're calculating and you find one move that your opponent can make that will refute the entire line that you've calculated, 
That doesn't mean that you should still play the line and just cross your fingers that they don't play it. That is not the way to play chess. You need to calculate as far as you possibly can, make sure that you are counting for specific moves that your opponent makes, not just, oh, and then my opponent will do something. You need to figure out what the best move your opponent can make is so that you can plan for it and see if it's dangerous or if you need to do something about that before you go for your own plan. And again, challenge yourself to think one more move further than you might have stopped before. And a lot of times that will help you find the best move in a certain position or prevent you from playing a move that's going to lose you material. Now, what is the best way to practice this kind of calculation? Puzzles. You have to do a lot of very difficult puzzles to get this sort of thought process running through your mind so that it is second nature when you're actually playing a game. So puzzles are obviously different than games because you are given a position completely raw and you know that there is a move that you can make that is completely winning, but you have to figure out what it is. In a real game, you don't know if you're winning or losing. You have to figure that out as you're playing the game. But puzzles are great practice for training your mindset. So when you are actually playing a game, you are thinking the same way that you would be if you were doing a puzzle, which is, okay, what is the best move in this position? What are my forcing moves? and what is going to win me this game. So I'm going to be doing some rated puzzles, so these should be challenging even for me because they're supposedly at like the highest level that I can calculate. So okay, immediately looking, do I have any checks? No, I don't. Uh, well, I do have this check, but it will just be taken, so I don't think I want to do that. Do I have any captures? Well, this knight is the problem piece that I'm looking at right now because my knight is currently hanging. And going back to the basics, you just have to count. So if I take, they can take. If I take with the rook, they can take with the king, and that looks pretty equal. I'm not sure if that's going to be the answer, because usually in puzzles you are going to be winning some kind of material, or you're going to be doing a checkmate. So now I'm thinking, well, what if I don't capture this knight, but what if instead I just move it back, save the knight, but also start attacking this rook? And then I'm thinking, if my knight is here, that's covering this square, which is also being attacked by this rook, and... If I were to move this pawn up and kick this knight out somewhere, I could potentially give a checkmate back here. So now it's a matter of move order, right? You have to be careful because if you immediately go, oh, I want to kick this knight out, well, then they're just going to take your knight. So we're still kind of in the ideas phase, so we have to think a little bit more concretely. So what happens if we move the knight here? Where's this rook going to go? Well, it can go back up, it can go here, it can go here, it can go here. That's about it. It can go pretty much anywhere. Now, I would imagine the most natural move after knight here would be for the rook to come here and attack our knight. Now, the question is, can we still just leave the knight there and continue with the plan of counterattacking this knight? So, okay, if the rook takes, we take here. Okay, we're taking with the pawn with check. That's going to win us more material. So the only other thing would be after here and here and then here if black doesn't take, but instead tries to prevent things from happening. I think the only other move potentially would be here because this pawn has moved away, but then we could probably just take and then we still get this or we can bring the rook up. I think that's far enough for me to calculate that this is the plan. Okay, so here, yep. And then we decided to push and then we decided to take and that's the end of the puzzle. So let's do one more just to make sure we really have the thought process down. So again, our immediate ideas should be looking for our forcing moves, right? So checks, captures, threats. So do we have any checks? Okay, we have quite a few checks actually. So the question is probably going to be which check is the best? What's our best move order here? So we have this check with the queen, we have this check with the queen, and we have this check with the rook. Now, it's not always best to go for the check that's going to win you a pawn because a lot of times in dire situations, the material count really doesn't matter. I mean, you know, black is up all the material here anyway, so we're really just looking for a checkmate. And I'm actually just going to rule this one out right away because even if it does lead to the checkmate, it's probably going to be a longer one because black will be able to block with this piece and then we'll get to take again. And we want the shortest checkmate possible, especially in these kinds of puzzles. So I'm going between this check and this check. So if we check with the queen and the rook comes down, then it's easy. We have a back rank checkmate. The king is completely blocked off and we win. The problem is after the queen checks, the rook doesn't have to block. This square is free for the king to go back. And so that's most likely what they're going to do. And then our rook would be under attack and our queen wouldn't really be able to help. And so 
again, we're sorting out the moves that don't work. We found one move that works, right? If we check in the rook blocks and then we mate, but we found one move that doesn't work. We check and the king moves back. And so I'm going to discard this plan. And now let's see if the plan checking with the rook works any better. So even though our queen is under attack, it doesn't matter because a check is a more forcing move. And so they can't take our queen because their king's under attack. So if we check with the rook, the king moves down. Now we can check here with the queen, right? And if we visualize this rook is up here, this queen is here, they're double attacking the black rook and it's only defended by one thing, which is the king. Now let's visualize again. The king is here. The queen is blocking off these three squares, right? and this square. So where can the king go? There's nothing that can block. The king has to go back here. And now we can take with either the queen or the rook. If we take with the queen, the king can escape down here. But because our queen is here, it's covering this square. So if we leave the queen here and take with the rook, that's a check and the king has no escape. So that's going to be our mate. So let's play it out. Check, check, and mate. So this is the kind of thought process that works. We come up with a plan. We look for our forcing moves first. Even in real games, it's good to look for your forcing moves. It's not just a puzzles thing. It works in like real games. That's why they make so many puzzles that start with a check. So then we can come up with a plan. We can go through the candidate moves that we have, go through the potential moves that our opponent could play that might cause us to refute certain parts of our plan, go back, come up with a new plan, fix the plan that we have, and eventually find the right solution. It's also important to note, especially on this last puzzle, right? Every move that we played was a check. It was a forcing move. If that wasn't the case, we would have to be calculating a little bit deeper to see if our opponent had any checks that they could play. You know, could this queen potentially come in and, you know, be giving us some checks over here, causing us some other issues? So again, you have to be focusing not only on what you want to do, what your plans are, but also what your opponent wants and what their plans might potentially be. I hope this helps you understand kind of the ideal thought process that you should have when you're calculating in a chess game and also give you some ideas for plans that you can use in different kinds of positions. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, please consider subscribing. It helps me out a lot. I'll see you soon.